good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. I am delighted to host this webinar today with a very distinguished scholar who is going to give us, I believe, a very thought-provoking talk on the subject of institutional genes totalitarianism in China. The speaker is Professor uh, Cheng Gang Xu. And Professor Xu is a senior research scholar at the Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, also at Stanford University. He is also a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. Before he relocated to Stanford, he had taught at the University of Hong Kong, the LSE, and at Tsinghua University in China. He was also a visiting professor at the Department of Finance at the Imperial College in London. Professor Xu was uh, educated at Harvard, where he earned his PhD in economics, and he is a distinguished economist of China, having been a recipient of the China Economic Economics Prize for contributions in the understanding of government and enterprise incentive mechanism for the transitioned economy in China. But the subject today is a bit different. Before I hand over to Professor Xi, uh, just let me um, reiterate that this session is recorded. And if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When you raise a question or make a comment, it would be very helpful to me as moderator to see who you are. But if you would like your identity not to be revealed, please say so at the start of your question and your wish for anonymity will be respected. No information that will identify you will be uh, given so that you can speak freely and raise whatever question you would like with Professor Xi. With that, let me hand over to you, uh, Chen Gang. Thank you very much, Steve, for the uh, invitation and for the very generous uh, uh, introduction. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming and for giving me a chance to share my views about uh, the institutions uh, in China. And today's talk is uh, based on a forthcoming book <clears throat> to be published by the Cambridge University Press uh, fairly soon, hopefully. <clears throat> the title of uh, today's talk is uh, Institutional Genes, Totalitarianism, uh, in China. <clears throat> Let me start from uh, <clears throat> talking about the uh, fundamental institution of the People's Republic of China. <clears throat> um, to be short, <clears throat> the, the nature of the fundamental institution of the PRC is the communist the totalitarianism with Chinese characteristics. But to be more precise and informative, I characterize that as a regionally decentralized totalitarianism. Regionally decentralized means that uh, although totalitarianism is the most centralized type of regime, but in terms of administration, and in terms of resource allocation, the Chinese regime 
is more decentralized to the local party state agencies. However, this extremely centralized nature of the totalitarianism is still there as the core of the institution is the Leninist party, the Chinese Communist Party. <clears throat> and uh, I'm also going to very briefly uh, mention about the evolution of the uh, <clears throat> Chinese regime, uh, how this regionally decentralized totalitarianism have been evolved. And uh, the reason uh, talking about this is because this is the foundation to understand China's reform, China's today, and its future as well. <clears throat> so when I uh, uh, characterize the Chinese institution as uh, uh, RDT, the Regionally Decentralized Totalitarianism, uh, people may argue that, uh, uh, so there are many different ways of uh, 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 of characterizing the Chinese institution. Why call that as a totalitarianism? So here I want to say that uh, this is actually not only from myself. The, uh, the more classic type of characterization of the Chinese institution actually has been given by Mao Zedong and by Xi Jinping themselves. So when Mao and Xi, they have repeatedly saying that the party leads everything. Uh, when they have repeatedly talking about this uh, party leads everything, they actually gives the definition. So in the following is the uh, <clears throat> is the formal definition, is the uh, uh, academic de definition uh, about the totalitarianism. So the party, so first of all, the party leads everything and the party monopolizes on ideology. The party monopolizes on armed forces. The party monopolizes on the police and the secret police and the judiciary. The party monopolizes on the media the party controls all organizations, all the businesses, all the resources in society, and the party controls all the data in the society. So the, the last, the very last uh, 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 part is the, uh, uh, is the contemporary version of totalitarianism, and all the rest have been given by Frederick and Brzezinski in 1956. <clears throat> For understanding uh, China, for understanding China's institution, in this book, I introduce a concept. It's called institutional genes. This is a, a, a analytical tool. The reason we uh, uh, introduce this kind of a concept is because uh, we uh, uh, many historians have observed that institutions actually evolve. They evolve from its past. So a famous uh, uh, saying that history repeats reflects this fact. The so-called repeats doesn't mean repeats every details. It repeats in some essences. <clears throat> so what, the, what, the, what I call the institutional genes means those basic institutional elements which are going to repeatedly self-reproduce. And uh, so these uh, self-reproduce the institutional elements would uh, usually relate to the structures of power, the structures of resource allocation, and also uh, uh, the basic beliefs among the population. And uh, the reason these uh, basic elements are going to be repeated by itself is because uh, the, the players of the game or the participants of inf, uh, the participants of institutional changes, they are going to reproduce this kind of a power structure, uh, uh, the resource allocation structure for their own interests. So that is the reason why we observe 
uh, uh, the so-called institutional genes. Moreover, these institutional genes are going to determine long-run institutional evolution. <clears throat> so if we look at uh, uh, the communist totalitarian regimes in the world, it's very striking that it took the communist totalitarian regimes only a half century to control one third of the world population uh, with China being the largest. So in the comparison, if we look at uh, uh, the Christianity, which is the largest religion, so for, for the Christianity expanding to covering one third of the world population, it took uh, the Christianity two, uh, uh, 2000 years. <clears throat> And uh, and then here, a, a so here a critical question is uh, why the communist the totalitarian uh, uh, system could uh, expand so rapidly, and when it expands so rapidly, the largest part is China. But here we we must be clear that uh, the institutional genes of communist totalitarianism were not from China itself. So it's imported. So that was from Soviet Russia. But then the question is, why did China embrace communist totalitarianism instead of constitutional democracy? And then we recall a famous uh, 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 alarm given by von Mises in 1946 means the end of the Second World War, the end of the Nazis uh, regimes. So he said that all the efforts to stop totalitarianism have failed. The question is why? And indeed, he was correct. So then here, uh, uh, so in, in this book, in, the, in today's talk, this, that is the central issue. So here uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we want to say that China's past and China's future, these are all depends on how its institutional genes change. So why the Chinese embrace the communist totalitarianism and why the communist totalitarianism have, have a such a deep root in China after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all the other uh, communist regimes in Central Eastern Europe. So now let's have a uh, very brief uh, uh, view of the institutional genes of the communist totalitarian party, the Bolshevik in Russia. So in the middle part of the institutional genes is the czarist imperial institutions, which is featured by monopoly of powers. So that is going to make constitutional reform in Russia very, very difficult. So here, IC means incentive compatible. So makes transition to, uh, uh, to constitutional democracy in Russia incentive incompatible. <clears throat> but, but this uh, <clears throat> imperial institution alone has to rely on other uh, uh, institutional genes. So on the left, the low, lower left corner, that is the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, or <clears throat> the Russian Orthodox Church actually is an essential part of the communist the totalitarian parties. It, it, it becomes an institutional genes for the communist totalitarian party uh, in terms of its propaganda, in terms of in terms of its way of penetrating society and, and controls ideology and as an organized ideology uh, organization, things like that. And then on the lower right corner, that is another institutional genes uh, uh, for the communist totalitarian party, which is the secretive political institutions or co also called uh, political terrorist institutions. So that actually uh, is, a, is, is a foundation for the Communist Party. So the Communist Party is not a regular political party in the sense that 
is a secretive, is uh, uh, not is it does not allow for competition, and uh, 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 is not voluntary. Instead, it's a secretive uh, political institution, and uh, that kind of institutional genes are coming from the Russian past. So here, the key point is that among these uh, three institutional genes, China share two of them. So one thing uh, uh, China is uh, lacking. So the one the one institutional gene that China does not have is the Russian Orthodox Church. So therefore, China alone would not be able to create a communist totalitarian party. So China has to rely on importing. However, because China shares two of the three institutional genes of a communist totalitarianism, that makes China easy to embrace the uh, 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 communist totalitarianism. <clears throat> so this is a brief summary of the evolution of China's institutions. So everyone knows that China has a very long history, a very long history of empire. So the Chinese empire lasted for more than 2000 years, which is the longest on earth. And uh, the institutional genes inherited from the Chinese empire is very helpful for China to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to be, uh, to be uh, converted into totalitarianism. But still China uh, needs an import of institutional genes from outside. So the, the, uh, totali the communist the totalitarian institutional genes, these are exogenous coming from Soviet Union. So from, from this, uh, <clears throat> from this uh, uh, diagram, you can see that uh, the Chinese uh, native institutional genes, oh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> plus, plus the exogenous institutional genes coming from Soviet Union combined to form this uh, uh, classic totalitarian, classic communist totalitarianism in China. So starting from 1949 up to 1957, that was a, a period of China that uh, China established a classic communist totalitarian uh, uh, regime. So in that period of time, China became a uh, <clears throat> Soviet Union uh, in terms of institutions. So it's just more backward economically, uh, but uh, in terms of institution, it's the same as those in Soviet Union. However, China did not <clears throat> consistently stick with this classic communist totalitarian regime. Instead, in 1958, China launched the Great Leap Forward campaign, which moved China away from the classic type of totalitarian regime. So starting from the Great Leap Forward movement, large amount of resources being delegated to the local governments and uh, uh, the administrative functions have been delegated to the local governments as well. So since then, China moved from a classic communist totalitarianism into a regionally decentralized totalitarianism. However, the Great Leap Forward movement was a great failure because it simultaneously, this, uh, uh, simultaneously dismantled the central planning, the Soviet type of central planning, and at the same time uh, uh, eliminated the market altogether. So without central planning, without a market, and uh, this kind of a, a new institution created a chaos. So it ended up with a great famine with nearly 40 million people died. So then the uh, Great Leap Forward movement had to be stopped 
1961-1962. But fairly soon, a few years later, the second move towards regionally decentralized totalitarianism was launched, which is the Cultural Revolution. So the Cultural Revolution actually dismantled the central agency, central party state agency in a more thorough way. So in the, during the Cultural Revolution, most of the central ministries have been dissolved. And even the, uh, 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 even the uh, judiciary system have been destroyed. Uh, so all the, all the functions, almost all the functions have been decentralized to the local governments. <clears throat> and at the end of the Cultural Re Revolution, in the 1970s, China basically has established a uh, <clears throat> consolidated RDT regime with uh, uh, most of the counties being self-contained in the functions, in the, in, in the composition of the economy. And indeed, this RDT regime is the fundamental institution uh, uh, for the post mao economic reform. We, we have to remember that the beginning of the post mao reform is the ending of the Cultural Revolution. So the whole reform is based upon the institutions inherited from the Cultural Revolution, which is the RDT regime. And indeed, the reason the Communist Party launched the reform is for saving the Communist Party, is for saving the totalitarian regime. It's because the Cultural Revolution has uh, <clears throat> uh, damaged the, uh, uh, the reputation of the party, damaged the lo legitimacy of the party. So the party found that uh, to recover, to regain control over the society, so the, the party found that they have to switch the party target from the party line from class struggles into economic development. But here we have to keep in mind that uh, economic development is not the purpose. Economic development here is for saving the party. And indeed, before launching the reform, Deng Xiaoping had uh, declared the four cardinal principles and uh, these four cardinal principles actually is the, re, uh, is, is the repetition of the basic principles of communist totalitarianism. Let, let me just uh, briefly summarize what are these four cardinal principles. Number one is socialism, but they, by socialism, it means communism. Uh, as uh, uh, Karl Marx made it clear that socialism is the fourth the stage, first the stage of communism. And the second is the party. The party must lead everything, which is the definition of a totalitarianism. The third is the ideology, is the Marxism, Leninism, Mausoleum thought. And the fourth is the dictatorship of the proletariat. So dictatorship, is the basic principle. Uh, uh, and uh, these have been the, the bottom line or the right line of the Chinese economic reform. And in the whole Chinese economic reform process, preventing peaceful evolution has been the bottom line for the Communist Party. The so-called peaceful evolution simply means that the private business is going to uh, uh, evolve into capitalism, but that is not, not that is not going to be allowed for. So on the one hand, the Chinese communists wanted to have economic development, and later they allowed for private sector to grow. But on the other hand, they have been alarming that preventing peaceful evolution is the bottom line, and the, the four cardinal principles. These are the bottom line. And these are actually the foundation for Xi Jinping taking over uh, the regime, for Xi Jinping reversing looks 
on seemingly reversing uh, the, uh, the direction of the development. <clears throat> So, so then we, uh, we, we observed that after 2012, 10 years ago, uh, the <clears throat> totalitarian regime has been uh, restored. There. <clears throat> now let's look at uh, the institutional genes of the Chinese communist regime or the PRC regime. So in the center of the institutional genes, is the party state bureaucracy. So on the one hand, this party state bureaucracy is highly centralized in terms of politics, in terms of ideology, and in terms of personnel control. Personnel control mo mostly focus on loyalty, loyalty to the party and loyalty to the uh, leadership. However, the administration and the resources these are decentralized to the local party state uh, bureaucrats. And moreover, the whole judicial system is within this bureaucracy. So there is no separate judicial system. The party leads the judicial system. But, but again, here, this uh, <clears throat> bureaucracy alone cannot stand. So the bureaucracy needs a foundation. The foundation is uh, the other institutional gene, uh, which is on the lower left corner. That is the resources. So the, the party state controls all the land in China. So literally, all the Chinese land in China are state-owned. And also, the party state controls all the banking system and it controls most of the financial resources. So these are going to, uh, to be the economic foundation of the party state bureaucracy. Also, because they have this legal, they, because they have this economic foundation, that is at the same time, the legal foundation for the party state to, uh, to control whole society. <laughs> but that still is not enough for uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, the uh, uh, party state bureaucracy monopolizing everything uh, in society. So then on the lower right, we have the third institutional genes uh, supporting this regime, which is the personnel and the ideolo ideology control. So the party completely controls the personnel matters and ideology. And that part is highly centralized. So through controlling personnel matters and ideology directly, the party actually is affordable to decentralize its administration and resource uh, control. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, institutional genes of the RDT regime, the regionally decentralized totalitarian regime. <clears throat> but where these uh, institutional genes come from? So we have mentioned that uh, the Chinese shared two institutional genes with the Suet uh, uh, regime. Uh, so the Chinese imported one institutional gene from them, which is the uh, <clears throat> which is the Orthodox Church that is related to ideology and related to the way of organizing ideology and penetrating the society. But this uh, here, when we show this uh, regionally decentralized authoritarian, uh, totalitarian regime, the institutional genes like this, we find that, that looks somewhat different from Soviet Union. So where these uh, uh, institutional genes come from. So now let's look at uh, the uh, Chinese empire. So since the Sui dynasty, the Chinese empire has already had matured all of these institutional genes in the place. And the structure looks like very similar to contemporary Chinese institution. <clears throat> so in the middle, uh, that is the bureaucracy. In the Chinese literature, historical literature, this is called 
uh, uh, Junxian system. But the so-called Junxian system actually essentially is the bureaucracy. It simply means that uh, the emperor and the and the, the the court of the the court the imperial court make appointments for controlling all the localities of the empire. So, and the so all the all the heads of the localities are the appointed bureaucrats. They are not they are not uh, uh, nobilities. <clears throat> So that differentiated the Chinese empire from the European feudal system. And this uh, bureaucracy also includes the judicial system. So there's no independent judicial system. And this Junxian system established uh, since the uh, Qin dynasty, Qin Shi Huang. <clears throat> but this Junxian system alone cannot stand because as long as you have uh, 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 the land being owned by uh, uh, nobilities, then the nobility would have inherited the power to challenge the empire. So therefore, since the very beginning of establishing the Junxian system under the Qin dynasty, the land system was imperial. So the imperial land system means that all the nobilities were eliminated. And uh, all the lands are literally controlled by the emperor, by the imperial court. So the imperial land system is the economic foundation and the legal foundation of the Chinese empire, of the Chinese imperial bureaucracy. But again, here, the bureaucracy plus the imperial land together are still not good enough to sustain the Chinese empire. And indeed, the Chinese empire disintegrated after, this, uh, after the Han dynasty, after ju just uh, several hundred years later, the Chinese empire disintegrated. And uh, after many 400 years of disintegration, eventually in the Sui dynasty, the Chinese empire was reintegrated. But since then, the Sui dynasty learned the lesson that the bureaucracy plus imperial, imperial land system were not good enough to sustain the empire. So therefore, the imperial exam system was established formally in Chinese called the Keju uh, uh, system. The imperial exam system is essentially for controlling the personnel controlling the selection of the bureaucrats and also is the, uh, is the control of ideology. So it's combining personnel control and ideological control together. And uh, 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 since the Sui dynasty and eventually it becomes uh, 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 per perfect, it, it, have, it perfected and uh, uh, matured in the Song dynasty. Since the Song Dynasty afterwards, there never ever been an internal challenge uh, to the uh, Chinese Empire. Again, I mean internal challenge. I mean from the uh, from the de facto nobilities. So there there will be no de facto nobilities strong enough to challenge the Chinese Empire anymore. So here we can see that these institutional genes have been passed down to the Chinese communists. <clears throat> so not only this part of the institutional genes are essential, there is another part of the institutional genes uh, which are terribly important for contemporary China. So that is the way of controlling the, uh, uh, the vast land. So what differentiates the Chinese uh, communist regime from the Soviet regime is that in the Soviet regime, the central ministries were, were the most powerful. And the central ministries through central planning are going to control directly all the enterprises by issuing instructions, issuing 
uh, plan, uh, planning indicators. But that is not the case in the Chinese regime since the Great Leap Forward campaign. So let's look at the, the governance structure uh, in China briefly. So on the left side of this uh, diagram here, we can see that the central administration function functions are divided into dozens of ministries. So here for illustration, I list only four of them. It should be many dozens. But on the right-hand side, you see the territorial control. The territorial control means sub-national level. So below the central uh, party state uh, agency, then China would have a provincial level and then have a prefecture level and then the county level. And uh, so in, in China in total, there are more than uh, 3,600 counties and for each county, the functions are going to be divided in the same way as in the central government. So corresponding to each ministry in the, at the county level, here you have the offices for each function. And all of these functions are going to be led by the party head of the county. Instead, instead of being controlled by the central ministry. So that is the key of the, control, of the controlling structure. And that is the key of the regionally decentralized totalitarianism. So how the regionally decentralized totalitarianism controls uh, uh, every county, controls every corner of the society. But again, here, where this uh, institutional genes come from. So then let's look at the, the Chinese uh, 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 empire. The uh, Professor Xu, yes. so, sorry to interfere. I'm getting uh, feedbacks from audience saying that they can't see your slides now. Uh, perhaps you, you, you can end the slideshow and restart the slideshow again and see whether people can see them. Can, can this be seen? I can see them, but there's some people who say that they cannot see the slideshow. I don't have problem seeing the slideshow at all. Uh, so then what should I do? And if you <laughs> if you close the slideshow and start again. Okay, okay, okay. So Thank you. Restart it, okay. Uh, okay. Can this be seen? Is this okay? Yes, I can. I can see it now. If you could maximize your your slideshow uh, on screens, then people yeah. might be able to. See. Okay. Yes. Is this okay? Let me check on the Q and A. People are saying that. Now, somebody suggests that that. The slides can be seen, but needs to click on the small screen on the top. So that is really for people who are not able to see the screen. Um, if you could look at the Q&A box, you will find at the, at the bottom that somebody is telling you how to do so. So okay. we can continue now. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yes, so, please continue. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Right, okay. So here, uh, yeah, just by uh, by looking at uh, the institutional genes of the Chinese uh, imperial Junxian system, here we can see the similarities. So starting, actually starting from the Qin dynasty, the Junxian system had been 
organized in this way. But here, what I'm showing is more uh, of uh, from the Sui dynasties. And particularly since the Sui dynasty, uh, this, uh, uh, the Chinese empire has uh, codified their way of uh, managing uh, the Chinese uh, administrative system. So just uh, uh, to illustrate how the institutional genes uh, 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 are outlined. So on the left-hand side is the functional control of the empire. So in since the Sui dynasty, there, there were always six ministries uh, responding, uh, 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 responding for the six functions, the personnel, uh, finance, education, military, uh, judicial, and uh, <clears throat> manufacturing. <clears throat> and, uh, but the empire is divided into provinces, prefectures, and the counties. And at each county level, they were the same six functions organized as offices. So each county <clears throat> is going to have the corresponding six offices. And the county head is going to lead all the six functions. And if a minister resp uh, responsible for one of the functions had inspection at the county level, and if the minister found something wrong or had something to say about the function at the county level, instead of intervening directly to that office, the minister is going to, is going to talk to the head of the county. And that is exactly the same way as today. So today, if a minister <laughs> inspects a county level, and finds something wrong, and then the minister is going to talk to the party secretary of that county. The, 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 the minister is not going to talk to the office of that function. And that is indeed uh, the meaning of the regionally decentralized the totalitarianism. So that differentiates from uh, the way that Soviet Union uh, operates. The reason here we spend time to explain this kind of a structure is because uh, uh, that is the key to understand uh, uh, why the Chinese reform uh, performs, po has performed so differently from those in Soviet Union. So in the Chinese reform, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the Chinese reform, the key difference from Soviet Union and other communist regimes is, uh, is that uh, the Chinese had the uh, <clears throat> private sector. And not only they allowed for private sector to grow, but actually the private sector becomes the uh, 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 majority of the Chinese economy. More than 80% of the Chinese employments are in the private sector. And uh, uh, that is a, 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 a that is the reason that the Chinese reform was uh, 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 the reform created a, 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 a decades of a high growth rate. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so the reason the Chinese could do it is be simply because uh, uh, it, it was organized in a regionally decentralized way and uh, <clears throat> all the local, party state bureaucrats were given uh, the target of competing for economic growth. And when they were competing for economic growth, they actually uh, uh, loosened the control over the private sector. When they loosened the control, they found that it, it was beneficial for the local economy. But because they were competing to each other, so if some of the local authorities loosen the control over the private sector, then the others would do so as well for the sake of competition. So even when the private sector was not legal, even when the communist party by the ideology 
And they should not allow for the private sector to grow like that. Uh, but it was uh, 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 just uh, not able to control it. And then eventually the Chinese Communist Party found that it was the private sector, the growth of the private sector actually saved the communist regime. So since the collapse of the communist party's regime in Central Eastern Europe and in Soviet Union, the Chinese realized this. And so then they eventually, uh, they recognized the private sector. However, here the key is that the, the reason the Chinese launched their reform is to save their regime, is not to change the regime. And then when the private sector becomes so overwhelmingly developed in the Chinese society, then they are worried. They are worried that the private sector is going to become a foundation of shaking up the communist regime, become a foundation of transforming the Chinese society. But that is not going to be allowed for. So then comes to the next. <clears throat> so then we have to, to understand today's China, to understand the political U-turn in China, we must understand what happened in Soviet Union. And uh, it's, it's simply because the Chinese regime is a, uh, uh, is, it comes from Soviet Union. So what happened on Soviet Union's yesterday? So it's because the, the Communist Party of Soviet Union wanted to hold their power. Because they wanted to hold their power to, to save the communist regime, although they wanted the economic reform, but they resisted the privatization. They did not allow for privatization, just for the sake of saving the regime. That leads to the total failure of their economic reform. And the failure actually paved the way for the collapse of the regime in former Soviet Union and Central Eastern Europe. <clears throat> but here we can make it clear that the conditions for collapsing actually were laid down since Brezhnev in the 1970s. <clears throat> But then what happened at the early stage of the Chinese re reform? That is because uh, <clears throat> conditional on the communist control, the, the, uh, the, the Chinese communists focused on the economy. They, that started from Deng Xiaoping. He believed that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was because of their failure in economic reform. So then as long as the communist party is able to control, then the Chinese economy must grow at whatever cost. <clears throat> so then indeed, the private sector saved the Chinese economy <clears throat> and the private sector, the growth of the private sector was unintentional from the point of view of the Chinese Communist Party. But as long as the private sector becomes that great, becomes overwhelmingly important in China, then the parties start to worry. So they, 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 what they worry most is the peaceful evolution. So therefore, in the recent years, we observe the systematic crackdown on the leading private firms and the large scale of purge of the leading entrepreneurs, and they ban freedom of speech, they ban freedom of assembly, and then drive China to the Brezhnev Soviet Union era. The reason I'm, say, I'm saying that they drive China to the Brezhnev Soviet Union era is because uh, what differentiates China from Soviet Union is the private sector, but now, they are in the drive of shutting down or containing the private sector. They are driving to expanding the state sector. And because of doing so, the Chinese economy 
has steadily slowed down and particularly in recent uh, several years, rapidly slowed down. And uh, <clears throat> so all of this uh, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the surface and also on the mechanism are similar to what happened in Soviet Union in the 1970s. And then finally, let me uh, uh, make a comparison between today's China and yesterday's uh, Soviet Union. <clears throat> the reason I, uh, uh, I do it is because uh, uh, we care about uh, uh, China's future. And uh, uh, we have seen what happened in Soviet Russia, what happened in, in today's Russia after the collapse of Soviet Union. We found that although the Although the totalitarian regime collapsed in Soviet Union, but they failed to establish constitutional democracy. The reason is because of the lack of institutional genes for supporting constitutional democracy. So then here we, <clears throat> we look at, uh, we, we are going to compare chi today's China with yesterday's Soviet Union by comparing their institutional genes of totalitarianism and also their institutional genes uh, uh, supporting constitutional democracy. So if we compare their institutional genes as a foundation of totalitarianism, we found that that institutional genes in China is going to be even stronger than those in Soviet Union in yesterday. <clears throat> so which means that uh, uh, the collapse in uh, the collapse of totalitarianism in China is going to be more difficult than that in Soviet Union. <clears throat> but then if we compare the institutional genes which are going to be the foundation for constitutional democracy, so I divide this into three parts, private property rights, the rule of law and the pluralist political uh, 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 factors. So then we find that uh, in, the, in terms of private property rights, actually China, today's China is a lot stronger than yesterday's Soviet Union. So if something happened, if China is pushed into the trajectory of a transformation, into constitutional democracy, this is a very positive part for China because China has a much larger private sector and much clearer minds, the mindset protecting private property rights and about operation, how to operate private firms uh, in China compared with uh, yesterday's Soviet Union. However, if we look at the other parts, the rule of law, in that, that part of the institutional genes in China is a lot weaker than in Soviet Union. And the pluralist political factors in China is also a lot weaker than yesterday's Soviet Union. So these parts, these parts of the institutional genes imply that uh, China is going to encounter a lot more difficulties than Soviet Union, uh, uh, if China was pushed to that trajectory, uh, transforming uh, to uh, uh, constitutional democracy. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Xu. That is absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. I would uh, like to invite you to start making your questions or comments in the Q&A box. But before I come to you, I wanted to discuss with you first, Professor Xu, your very important and interesting idea of these institutional genes. And I think what you have said, what you have presented, provides a very powerful case if we look at what happens on the mainland of China. 
But if we look at China in a slightly different way, if we don't simply equate China with the mainland of China, but include also Taiwan and Hong Kong, then we have a different set of questions. Because we will have the issue of, for example, the institutional genes in Hong Kong is not weak with the rule of law. It's clearly very strong with the rule of law. And the institutional genes for pluralistic politics is very strong in Taiwan. And um, slightly less strong in terms of the rule of law, but they are moving in that direction. And likewise with Hong Kong, the rule of law was stronger, but the pluralistic politics was weaker, but they're moving more in that direction. Of course, until all this were being uh, upset by the national security law of 2020, when all these were being put to an end. And also in terms of the uh, cons the institutional change about property rights, they were also pretty strong in those places. So the question really is that if we are looking at the institutional genes, are we looking at really just what happened on the mainland of China? Or are we really need to be looking at it in a more broader definition of what China is, which incidentally happens to be what the Communist Party's definition of China is as well? Right. I, this is really a great question. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, when we uh, try to apply this uh, concept to uh, do our analysis, then we have to be uh, very careful uh, to see uh, uh, the particular uh, place. For example, when we look at uh, Taiwan, then we have to uh, realize that, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, the, uh, the Chinese empire ruled Taiwan for only 200 more years, less than 300 years. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, the the uh, the institution the insti the 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 institutional genes of the Chinese imperial system in Taiwan was fairly shallow. It's a far away from the mainland, and it was ruled very short in a very short period of time. And then under the Japanese rule, uh, <clears throat> so there was a period of time that uh, Japan was. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, was pushing for the constitutional democracy uh, during uh, uh, during uh, 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 1914 up to the end of the 1920s, and uh, they try to uh, 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 they try to promote uh, a constitutional democracy not only in Japan but also in all the colonies, and indeed in that period of time, uh, the the Taiwanese had their local elections and the Taiwanese had their uh, uh, political parties organized. And I regard those as uh, institutional genes of constitutional democracy. So th those institutional genes, although were not very strong, but were already there in Taiwan in, before uh, the Second World War. And that moreover, <clears throat> The, the impact of the Soviet Union was mainly in the mainland China, uh, not in Taiwan. So that part of the institutional genes didn't uh, have a forceful influence there. And then the next is that uh, after uh, the uh, uh, after the uh, 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 the Republic of China uh, regained control of Taiwan uh, after the Second World War. Uh, they implemented uh, uh, the uh, the constitution of the Republic of China for a short period of time. So they ha they had uh, all the uh, uh, local elections, uh, and then uh, then there there was a period of authoritarian uh, uh, cracking down, but the institutional genes have been there already. Moreover. Uh, although the Kuomintang is an authoritarian party, they didn't like a constitutional democracy, but uh, their constitution, at least uh, uh, in the paper, 
the constitution is uh, is constitutional, <laughs> uh, uh, which means that uh, at least the Kuomintang would not be able to eradicate uh, to eradicate uh, all the rules of the institutional genes uh, uh, pro which are pro constitutional democracy, and uh, uh, also that constitution support the private ownership. So the private ownership uh, uh, being consolidated in Taiwan uh, in several decades before the final transformation. So here put together, before the final transformation from an authoritarian regime into a full uh, 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 constitutional democracy, Taiwan actually had already fairly strong institutional genes uh, uh, being the foundation of constitutional democracy. And then talking about Hong Kong, then the, the colonial era of Hong Kong has, has changed Hong Kong fundamentally. So and since under the, under the colonial rule, uh, uh, Hong Kong essentially inherited uh, the, uh, <clears throat> inherited the ideology and institution from the Great Britain. Uh, although it was a colony, it didn't have, it didn't enjoy democracy, but it's constitutional. Uh, and uh, and in terms of a democracy, uh, uh, actually uh, in my book I uh, documented that, that part of the historical facts, which is that in the 1950s, the uh, uh, the British government uh, planned to uh, push forward democracy within Hong Kong just like uh, what the British did in other colonies. But the Chinese communists uh, did not allow for this. And the Chinese communists uh, warned the British that if they ruled Hong Kong as a colony, they would uh, keep Hong Kong as a British colony. But if the British uh, 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 set up election in Hong Kong, then they then the Chinese communist is going to send army to occupy Hong Kong. So with, the, with this threat, the, uh, the, the British government uh, withdraw their plan. So they, they actually, Hong Kong was among the few of the British, uh, former British colonies, which did not implement uh, democracy like uh, other uh, former uh, colonies uh, of, uh, of British. So here, uh, to summarize, what I'm saying is that uh, although geographically uh, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong are regarded as a part of the greater China, but in terms of institution, Hong, uh, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, had been in different institutions and, uh, and at the same time, they had different institutional genes. Okay, there are already quite a few quite a few questions here. Um, the first question I picked comes from somebody who would like to stay anonymous. The question is about um, what Professor Failing Wang has already described as this CCP's institutional genes being suboptimal and inefficient. And the question is. Would you like to elaborate on the institutional force of the current system in place in China and whether the Communist Party system today can be seen as a genuinely stable one? And what would it take to get the systems to break down? Right. Uh, very good question. Um, yeah, the current uh, uh, Chinese institution is not stable. The reason is the following. Uh, supposedly, if the Communist Party allows for the whole overall trend of the economic uh, reform, just keep going, then they suppose they allows for that. Then indeed, they uh, as long as they allow for private sector to expand further, 
And uh, also the private sector would require uh, protect legal protections of the pri private sector. And so then you have to uh, uh, gradually establish a rule of law to protect the private sector. And also the private sector uh, associated with the growth of the private sector, you have uh, um, their own organizations. Actually, private business itself is already organization. And then they have their own commercial organizations, all other kinds of organizations. And all of this, as long as the Communist Party allows them to grow further, these are going to become the foundation of shaking up the totalitarian rule. So it's unstable in that sense. So that is why the Communist Party would not allow for them, allow them to, 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 to grow further. And that is actually, that is the explanation why uh, it things happened in the recent uh, many years. So many people uh, thought that uh, the reason uh, uh, in the recent years things become that bad is only because that one person. But actually that is the exaggeration of that one person's uh, uh, will and exaggeration of that one person's power. The reason that one person uh, has that power is exactly because he has that machine. That machine is the institution. And uh, he is the driver of the machine. Uh, and uh, so, so then when uh, the Communist Party does not allow for private sector to grow further, for the stability of their political system, then it's going to weaken its economic foundation. And that is what we are seeing now. So by weakening its economic foundation, that is why I'm saying that uh, today's China is, is, a, 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 is a, a, a driving towards yesterday's Soviet Union. So then eventually uh, it's going to uh, further weaken and shake up the uh, 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 the Chinese regime. But if that is going to collapse or not, uh, this is a much more difficult question, uh, to uh, much more difficult prediction to make. So I'm not able to predict uh, the collapse of the regime because we have, uh, we have another example, which is North Korea. So North Korea is very, very poor and its economy is very unstable, uh, but the regime could last because uh, uh, they could use the brutal force uh, to maintain. Uh, that is the feature of a totalitarian regime. So this is, uh, 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 but, but here, this is more, a, a bit more like uh, our understanding of earthquake. So, so what we're saying is that the condition is there, but when, things are going to happen and in is go, in what way is going to happen we don't know okay well, next question i pick comes from uh pramd poda professor poda and the question he puts to you is about your reference to the russian orthodox church as one of the institutional genes of the bolsheviks of the soviet union and what he would like to ask is what about Confucianism or Neo-Confucianism, which you have not mentioned? And since Xi Jinping talks a lot about it, does it matter? Is it part of that institutional genes or is it not relevant? Okay, very good question. Uh, uh, I, the, the reason I didn't mention Confucianism is uh, only for sake of uh, time. So when I talked about uh, uh, Koji system, the, imperial exam system. Actually, I have a whole chapter uh, about this issue and uh, Confucianism is uh, one of the uh, uh, key issues there. Uh, but indeed, if we compare the Russian Orthodox Church with Confucianism together uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Koji system, there is a, a difference, this distinctive difference. They, uh, uh, the 
of the, the Russian Orthodox Church is a <clears throat> is a uh, organized ideology. It penetrates the society. Penetrates society means not only for uh, the intellectuals, not only for people who can read. It penetrates everyone, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, Orthodox. Uh, uh, Orthodoxy uh, was a uh, language, was a cultural, was a religion uh, before the existence of Russian as a nation, uh, and uh, also the ortho <coughs> the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox uh, had a had a whole uh, set of instruments for doing propaganda and for inciting people uh, and uh, for people, uh, uh, for inciting people who would even, who even voluntarily like to die as a martyr and uh, for uh, creating a, a personality cult, so on and so forth. So that is why the, uh, and, and also the ideology. Uh, so I have a whole chapter about the origin of communist ideology. And the origin of communist ideology actually is rooted in Christianity. And uh, the Russian Orthodox would uh, uh, beneficial more from this root. Uh, uh, so put all of this together, indeed, the uh, <clears throat> Russian Orthodox, or Russian Orthodoxy and Russian Orthodox Church, these uh, <clears throat> are essential parts of the Bolshevik party. And Stalin, he himself was educated in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 in, 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 uh, in Orthodoxy. And, and so as many others. Uh, top leaders uh, and the founders of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Bolshevik, uh, but uh, the Confucianism and uh, the the Confucianism and uh, the uh, Kirji system, these are indeed important uh, uh, institutional genes of today's China, indeed, uh, uh, but uh, these are more related to the way of ruling China rather than creating the Communist Party. So the, if we look at uh, today's operation of the Communist Party, then you find that uh, the essential parts of Communist Party were not from Chinese tradition. So these were all from uh, Soviet Russia. And uh, the Soviet Russia uh, actually inherited partly from the uh, uh, Orthodox Church. Okay. Uh, before I put the next question to you, Professor Xu, would you mind ending the slide show so okay. that people can see you in uh, larger okay. screens than the thumbnail? Brilliant. Thank you. The next I'm picking is it comes from uh, Yingzi. And in fact, uh, Yingzi is asking really two questions, but they are both interesting and relevant. So I'll put that to you. The first question really is about what impact do you think COVID-19 pandemic has on the resilience of China's totalitarianism? And the second question is about the urbanization in China. Since you talk about the control over land being a very important part of the institutional genes. And the question then is whether the fast, faster pace of urbanization is going to change that. If so, how? Okay, yeah, very good question. <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the, the COVID uh, uh, period, uh, uh, so in the in the COVID period, uh, we see huge impacts in two opposite directions. So one direction is uh, is related to 
controlling the whole society through all the means. So the uh, because of the uh, uh, so because the Communist Party uh, imposed uh, this uh, zero COVID policy, and they, then they have a great uh, excuse to impose uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> truly totalitarian uh, 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 controls over the whole population through all the means. So it's, it's a, a important exercise, it's important uh, 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 training and, uh, uh, and reinforced their way of controlling every citizen through high tech. However, just exactly because of this, and exactly because of the brutality of this controlling everyone in the every uh, at, at every time for anything, uh, so the resentment became so strong. So at the end of the zero COVID uh, period, there was a nationwide waves of resistance. Uh, so. So here uh, we can see that uh, it, it, it has uh, two uh, impacts, right? And talking about urbanization, uh, uh, urbanization uh, uh, actually, uh, if we if yeah if we if we look at it, this happened in during the reform period, at the beginning at the earlier stages of the uh, reform the urbanization was not planned. The urbanization uh, uh, process, just like uh, uh, private uh, firms, these were unintentional. This just happened. So these were the consequences of the land reform uh, in agriculture. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the impact is huge. So through this uh, uh, urbanization process, here uh, in, in the mainland China, there are hundreds of millions of the second citizens living in the cities. So with a such huge uh, 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 crowd in the city, it's actually a huge uh, uh, unstable factor for the society. So we may recall what happened when Cai Qi became the mayor of Beijing. So just uh, a month or a couple of months after being the mayor of Beijing, he uh, uh, made a, a brutal decision to destroy homes of hundreds of thousands of the peasant workers, try to uh, 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 get rid of them from the city. They were different interpretations why he did it. So my interpretation is that uh, because he realized, he anticipated the social unrest from this second class citizens in the city. So then he would try his best to get rid of them from his jurisdiction. Uh, uh, so to, uh, 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 to uh, reduce the pressure. So that's my interpretation. But whatever interpretation is, uh, uh, this is going to be a huge uh, uh, factor hidden there. And when things go wrong, when the whole system become uh, uh, unstabilized, uh, so you're, you're, you're going to anticipate the social unrest uh, from this foundation. Uh, next question I pick comes from somebody who likes to stay anonymous. And the question is not actually directly about your presentation, but I think it's something that people will be interested in. And the question is about what do you think um, the death of former Premier Li Keqiang means in terms of its impact on Chinese society, Chinese politics, and perhaps even on your um, analysis on the resilience or not of the system. Right, right. It is uh, relevant. <laughs> um, 
Right. Yeah, I would uh, interpret uh, uh, this uh, incident uh, as a triggering uh, inc incident. So, so the next the issue is, or uh, what we are going to observe or waiting to observe is uh, how uh, how much this is going to trigger. Uh, so it becomes a more like a coordination mechanism. So under the totalitarian rule, information is censored and uh, 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 people's behavior were monitored and uh, 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 the totalitarian rule is a rule by terror. So under the rule of terror, under the uh, censorship of information, under the uh, close monitoring of behavior, uh, essentially that uh, would uh, uh, make everyone isolated uh, because uh, is isolation means that they are not able to coordinate but as long as the people are not able to coordinate, then uh, uh, the totalitarian rule would sustain. Uh, but once you have such a triggering event, it might trigger, might become a coordination mechanism. So then people were sort of coordinated uh, 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 to, be, uh, <clears throat> to participate. Uh, uh, so they, they were examples, <clears throat> historically, they were examples. One example was <clears throat> at the end of the Cultural Revolution <clears throat> in the uh, April 5th of 1976. So they, they, uh, <clears throat> the coordinating uh, 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 mechanism was the uh, Chonen Lai, uh, so morning of uh, Chonen Lai. So, um, and the second uh, would be uh, uh, the June 4th uh, uh, event in uh, China that was triggered by the death of Hu Yaobang. And all of these actually share this kind of similarities. But of course, the Communist Party learns the lessons. So by learning the lesson, uh, they were now under high alert and try their best to contain. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, people are also learning. So they have uh, their way of coordinating. So, uh, but uh, again, I'm not able to predict, uh, but uh, my anticipation is that uh, this is going to become a triggering uh, event, uh, uh, helping uh, lots of people uh, uh, to coordinate. So even in case they fail to have an immediate, uh, 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 immediate uh, 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 action, observable action, uh, but this coordinated uh, uh, call, the coordinated voice is going to have uh, deep roots. So it's going to change people's mind. Uh, in a uh, uh, very strong way. Thank you. This being potentially the last question that I can pick for you. Uh, hopefully we can squeeze in more, but it could be the last. I'm going to pick something that is completely different. And this comes from uh, Connor Yang. And the question is about what do you think democratic countries sh should treat China, should deal with China, in light of your thesis that China is this type of totalitarian system. Right, I, I, I believe, uh, <clears throat> uh, very good question. Uh, the, actually part of the motivation for me to write this book is to, uh, <clears throat> is to talk to uh, uh, the people who are not in China, who are not Chinese, uh, uh, for their understanding of the nature of the Chinese regime. So my concern is that uh, the misunderstanding of the nature of the Chinese regime is, is, a, is a huge issue, and it contributes to uh, many uh, mistakes. 
So there, there's a word called uh, 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 get China's wrong. So why they get China's why they get China wrong is is because uh, they didn't understand the nature of the regime. But uh, actually, if they understand the nature of the Chinese regime, which means that uh, it's essentially the same as the Soviet Union in the Cold War, and then uh, uh, they are. <clears throat> No matter the policy and uh, the public opinion, uh, all of this should move to the direction, uh, to the past, that uh, how they deal with Soviet Union. Uh, so here, a key issue is to separate uh, the uh, <clears throat> separate the Communist Party from the Chinese people, to separate the regime from the Chinese people. And they should uh, support the Chinese for their efforts, for their endeavors uh, uh, towards constitutional democracy. So they must uh, support. Uh, and uh, so this is not uh, uh, something anti-China. This is uh, uh, something about uh, supporting China. So supporting a constitutional China supporting a democratic China against a totalitarian regime. We are one minute from closing, but since you 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 end your last un your answer to the last question on the point of constitutionalism, um there is actually a question from uh Christian Yang who wants to ask you about if China would move in the direction of constitutionalism, where do you see the driving force coming from? From public mobilization or from internal changes within the Communist Party? Okay, great question. It, uh, it has to come from within. But when I say from within, I didn't mean mainly Communist Party. I mean mainly from the Chinese from the Chinese citizens within China. So who are they? They are the, uh, <clears throat> so, so if we look at today's China, then we find uh, there is a very large uh, community of private entrepreneurs. There's a very large community of owners of private properties. And, and they are a large community of NGOs large community of civil society. And uh, we have uh, 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 numerous uh, 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 great lawyers, intellectuals. So these are the foundations uh, for China uh, to transform from a totalitarian regime into uh, a constitutional regime. And of course, uh, the international support is crucial is always crucial. Uh, so that requires uh, the uh, uh, democracies not getting China wrong. So when they get China wrong, they, they refuse to support the Chinese. When they refuse to support China, then uh, uh, they, they treat China simply as a administration. When they get China wrong, then it, they makes Chinese uh, transformation extremely difficult or almost impossible. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that it is my duty to have to draw this very interesting webinar to a close. I do apologize to those of you who have put questions to Professor Xi and the questions I simply cannot find times to fit into this webinar, but please be reassured that your questions will be saved and they will be shared with Professor Xi so that he will know what were the questions and comments that I have not been able to put to him at this webinar. And I'm delighted that at least at the end of this webinar, we end on a rather more positive note than on the more pessimistic note. With this, let me draw this to a close. Thank you very much, Professor Xi, 
And I hope to see some of you in person next week at SOAS when a more positive picture of China will be presented. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Professor Xu. That was great.